This is Maasai land. And during a drought and tough times, the locals have a special visitor, Winnie Bianyima. She's the head of the UN agency tasked with combating HIV and AIDS. She says we are not on track to end it and blames a global system as unequal as ever. I came here to ask her why. This is the interview. Winnie Bianima, really good to have you on the interview. Thank you, it's an honor. Thank you for having me. I was privileged to observe you interact with the community here, uh, Maasai herding community in Kenya, down on the ground. Big difference to the corridors of power or corridors of bureaucracy in Geneva. Um, tell me why this means so much to you as the executive director of UNAIDS. Well, first of all, I've, I'm so honored. I'm wearing this Maasai dress and it's a gift I got this morning. Maasai are pastoral people of Kenya. I come from a pastoral background and uh, my people are cattle keepers. Wearing this makes me reflect on the fact that uh, I've been nomadic really my life. My life journey has been nomadic. I am passionate about social justice, about equality of people and Every job I've done has taken me somewhere in the area of pushing for social justice. So I'm so connected and I'm inspired and I take my energy from people on the ground, from communities. There's a way to fight for social justice is to organize people to claim their rights. And this is where I've put my life, a lot of my life. So coming to communities is like filling my tank Coming to communities is like believing again and overcoming challenges I find in the global space where I'm a decision maker. Tell me how it intersects this social justice, listening to people and the battle against HIV and AIDS. Yeah, you see, HIV is a pandemic. It's a virus that destroys the body and leads to death. However, over 40 years, tools for preventing, for testing, for treating have come up. They are available. The only reason today that we still have people newly infected, this region is mostly girls and young women. The only reason that people still die is because of injustice, social injustices, inequalities in society. So you find that here in Africa, it's mostly girls and young women because they suffer so many inequalities from the social norms, from the laws, from the lack of opportunity in schools. In, and all these come together to make them more at risk. You come to gay men, you find that gay men, this disease is continuing to rise instead of decrease. They die more of AIDS. Why? Because they are discriminated. Because laws that criminalize them drive them underground and away from services. So if we were to repeal laws like that, if we were to equalize boys and girls, men and women in society, and equality meaning that we also end sexual violence that we are talking about here, these are the things that will stop new infections, and help everyone to be on treatment if they need treatment. So to me, HIV AIDS is a disease, but it's more a social injustice. Uh, uh, it's driven by inequalities in society. So who needs to make the decisions to move those gears? Who's your audience when you say we need to do more? Right, several layers. There is what we need from the international system. From the international system, we need to enable countries such as here, Kenya, such as Uganda, such as the developing countries where the epidemic is concentrated, to be able first to have access to the best that science produces. 
that is in terms of the treatments, the, the preventives, the tests. But today, the best innovations go to people in rich countries first. We are trying to get, for example, a long-acting injectable. That injectable could be a game changer for girls you saw here. Why? Because they are having sex early. They fear their parents. They cannot go for a test. They will not go on treatment as soon treatment because they don't want to be seen. The stigma is strong. The sanctions of society are strong. But if you can get an injection instead of taking tablets daily, once in a couple of months, you're safe. You go once, you take the risk, and then you're safe. So we'll get more adherence to treatment if we can get that new treatment here. But no, it won't. A company will hold it, fix the price, price countries like this out of it, and it will be available for those who probably don't need it as much and not to those who need it more. Gay men in these countries hide from the law. They are arrested even for carrying a condom. They, they, they are hunted. So an injectable could be what they need to prevent and an injectable for treatment. So the tools of science are not equally available. That's one. The international system can change that by changing the rules at the WTO. They are called trade-related intellectual property rules. Changing them so that science, scientific innovators are rewarded differently for their innovations and their innovations come here quickly. That's one. Inequalities for girls. That, so that's at the global level, right. one of the inequalities there. At the country level, repealing criminal laws that are driving people away from prevention and treatment is critical. And overcoming stigma, leaders need to go out there and say, you're not a criminal or sinner because you're living with HIV. You just had it transmitted to you by a sexual partner. So stigma kills, stigma kills, criminalizing law, to chase people away from life-saving treatment. Those need to be removed. But more importantly here in Africa, you need to pay attention to equalize boys and girls, men and women in the society. And that's tough because it's in the culture, it's in the social norms. And those are hard to change because they've been accumulated over years and years. They are part of people's identity. But we have to challenge some of them and change them, like tolerating sexual violence. I asked a question here of the girls. I said, well, if your husband beats you or your boyfriend beats you, what do you call that? And they said, oh, it's violence. Then one of them said, but he will say he's correcting me. Exactly. I said, but why should he correct you? Why should he dialogue with you and you agree what's the right way forward in your family? So getting people to shift away from violence, particularly sexual violence, is a challenge and it needs to be invested in by both the government and the opinion leaders, the churches, the mosques, the, they all need to come to a consensus that we want to end violence in sexual relations and move on it. So these are not things that can happen without a consensus in the society. So we need everybody on board. But also the, some of the laws are ridiculous. There are laws, for example, that to go to do a test for HIV in this country until recently, you needed to be 21 years old. Otherwise, you should go with a guardian or a parent. Who's going to go with their parent? Who's, who's going to tell the parent that I think I might be HIV, a little girl? But she doesn't even admit she's having sex, leave alone saying, I may, I may, be, I may have contracted something. So, but the same constitution allows a girl who is 13 year old to marry. She's old enough to marry, but not old enough to go for a test on her own. See, but now I hear that it has been changed now down to 15, at least to that. But there are laws to change. 
that empower a girl and a woman to make independent decisions about their body. Many things. We must get girls in school. This is part of what I'm saying here. I'm mobilizing leaders to be ambitious about keeping all girls in school up to the end of secondary school, at least. Because when you do that, our evidence shows that that girl's risk of contracting HIV is reduced by nearly a half, 50%. But they are not in school because the parents are asked to share the cost with the government and the parents don't have the money and they have a culture of marrying them off early and getting cows as dowry. So you need to work on that, the government investing more in education, be more ambitious to roll out free education, and campaigning against early marriage, prohibiting it by law and campaigning against it. Right. So there's a lot. Yeah, there's a lot of things. A lot of things. There's a, there's a long list. It's on, not one thing. On the menu. Yeah. Uh, but it's actionables. Yeah. But I love it because it's about empowering girls and women to challenge gender inequalities. And it's about men and women also having a dialogue and agreeing to live in equality. These are things I love, these struggles. And they solve more than just HIV and AIDS. Exactly, mm. they solve more than HIV. When we, when we look at the disease in particular, or the virus in particular, you, you spoke of fallacies at a government level Historically, we've seen governments who don't understand the science or refuse to accept yeah. the scientific consensus. The country that I grew up in, South Africa, one of the major stains on Thabo Mbeki's legacy was that he wasn't sold on the, on the efficacy of antiretrovirals. And he said, oh, just eat vegetables, you'll be okay. And many, many blamed him for prolonging the epidemic in, in the country as a result of that. Have we at the very least moved beyond that sort of thing where you have a general consensus among governments when it comes to the science and how to, if people have the virus, to be able to live a dignified, healthy life with it, to be able to control it, and to minimize the mass deaths when it, when it comes to contracting, possibly contracting AIDS? That's a good question. On the science, we have got now a consensus. And by the way, South Africa turned around from denialism to become actually the country that has achieved the fastest progress in terms of reducing deaths and reducing new infections in the last 10, 12 years. So that turnaround about accepting that this, the science says you can take something and live a long life. And there's also something to prevent. That's agreed. However, there are, there is some de denial of the evidence in quite a number of countries. For example, we have the evidence that when you repeal criminal laws on same-sex relations, that the risk of the new infections amongst gay men, men who have sex with men, drops significantly. Because you don't have everything underground all the yeah, time. Exactly. We have the evidence to show that and we show it to leaders, but political leaders are trapped by uh, conservative forces in their country. Culture, ideology. Yes. So they continue to press against some of them, even to oppress, like in my country, Uganda, to oppress LGBTQ people, men who have sex with men, transgender people. And these are the same people amongst whom the disease is rising and not decreasing. So that's a kind of a denial of, on the one hand, they want to end AIDS. They know that the groups where it, it is growing instead of decreasing are gay men, transgender sex workers, people who inject drugs, but they still pursue policies that drive them away from treatment and care. So that's the kind of thing. So we try to keep them honest. Every year we bring them new data, showing them you're doing well in the mainstream population. You're doing badly in these groups of people. So this is what we do. Does that put you in a little bind when you have to criticize your home country and say, I'm sorry, this is wrong. I completely disagree with it. And you hold the office 
at the UN, you're not just a private citizen. You're somebody at the pinnacle of a UN body. Does it make life complicated for you? Actually not. I still love my role and uh, the positioning I've had all my life of being someone who fights for justice. Right now, I'm about to send a, a, a tough rebuke to a general in the Ugandan army who made a speech. He had done a good job. They had built a clinic, handing it to a community. He says, I don't let those homosexuals use this clinic. They are like pigs. They are like this. And I'm going to hit back at him and tell him that he has no right and no power to send any Ugandan away from a public clinic. Well, I look forward to seeing that letter. I love to do that. So I I find that the United Nations gives me a platform where we have shared values. We promote a set of values, a universal set of standards, agreements that all governments have committed to and reminding them politely or even a little forcefully that they need to honor their agreements is something that it gives me a buzz. And her husband is also someone who gives us a headache as a political activist. So That bitch I leave. <laughs> I don't refer to that. About her husband, he is Ugandan opposition leader Kiza Besidje, whose political work sees him get in trouble with the authorities again and again, and again. I wonder, do you, I mean, I, I, again, this idea of like, I mean, you were in politics at home, and again, you have the international platform, you were the, at the head of Oxfam, now UN AIDS. Were you always comfortable with having that duality to you? Uh, speaking your, your mind, your truth on issues at home, but also representing international institutions? I, I have to tell you that like I said, I'm a nomad in my career. I go where my heart takes me. I go where the next battle is for justice. And I've found that whether it was Oxfam, whether it's the United Nations, that my values, what makes me get up and want to make a difference in the world is what these organizations stand for. So I've usually found that I'm comfortable. I know that I can be controversial, because I can be a little forceful and uh, the United Nations is intergovernmental and once... You're supposed to be a diplomat. Yeah, you're supposed to be a diplomat, but... Do you get any raps on the knuckles? No, I haven't, but <laughs> I'm so lucky to work under the leadership of Secretary General Antonio Guterres. He's of the same mind. He's a committed social justice person. He's from the left. I am from the left. He was a socialist prime minister. I share a vision with him. So I have I've only had encouragement from him for taking tough stands, for speaking and standing for UN standards, UN values, UN agreements. Do you like being the rebel at the IMF, at Davos, at all those different platforms where you're in the room with the fat cats and you're saying, this is unacceptable, this must change. Do you enjoy that? I like holding their feet to the fire. I do like it. I like to hold them accountable on behalf of those who don't have a voice in those spaces. I feel so lucky to have the networks, to have the possibility to be in spaces where top decision makers are, global leaders are. But I also feel that they go out of their way to insulate themselves from the voices of people. How do they do that? Oh my God, why would they go to Davos tell me to set a global agenda? in those mountains, freezing, where the billionaires go to ski, and then they lock themselves in. They allow in only a few of us. So when I get there, I give it to them. I tell them what they want. It's because you're feeling cold, that's why. I don't like the cold. No, it takes a lot of courage. It takes yeah. a lot of courage. It's true. Then Do you get pushback when you're there and you're... Plain. You're, well, you're, you're speaking truth to power. Yeah. How does that manifest? They're not going to roll over and die. So what happens then? And I'm also not uh, naive to think that when I tell them, they listen and they do what we want for ordinary people. But I have seen over time that when you are consistent in your messaging, 
when you mobilize out there and you start, then you start to get global leaders. First they deny, then they accept there's a problem, and then you get into the space of what are the policy solutions. On the question of inequalities, we've gotten there. When we started a double saying that inequalities are widening, they said that's not the problem. Problem is something is poverty. The problem is handouts for people. Said, but they're no. abstracts also. They do any of these people understand the issue in reality? Now many do. You know, when we started this, we started getting the voices from power, political power, from faith, from admitting that there is a problem and that these are the root causes. We got someone like the Pope saying, inequality is the root of social evil. And then we got the IMF doing its own researches and saying, we got it wrong. Inequalities undermine long-term growth. So we started getting a consensus coming from key global leaders, but on the problem, but not yet on the solution. So now we move to the solution space. So today we debate more about how do you reduce these inequalities? We don't debate, do inequalities hurt growth? Do inequalities trap people in poverty? That's agreed, but that's years of campaigning. It was years of campaigning. I noticed earlier on you were asking a lot of questions of the young girls and women here. Yeah. It's not often that you, I come across people who are heavily credentialed in very big leadership positions who listen to anyone. So um, tell, me, tell me what you learn from them. I mean, you're, you're a person who's curious, you ask questions. Tell me why it's important to speak to young people. It's so important because many times we act for them on their behalf and we solve the problem that's not their problem and their problems remain unresolved. It's so important that not only you hear their own voices about what's troubling them, what's stopping them from living the life they want, but also being shocked by it, feeling the pain. I never, never want to be that person who talks from the empirical evidence. Our research has said this and our research has said that it's dry and for me it is also illegitimate. I want to feel someone's pain. I want to know that I talked to somebody who showed me their fears and their pains and that's the person whom I can go and represent and I can fight for. So. These opportunities not only inspire me, but they make me feel credible, legitimate. They give me the power. When I, when I hear the voices of people who suffer the indignity of poverty or violence, it's so important. What gives you hope? Lots. The human spirit, the fact that people fight, people don't sit up and die, and that, and that people living in poverty are brilliant people People who suffer these indignities of ill health and what are clever, are innovating, are fighting, are resilient, and they are my allies. That is the important thing. And I've found it a challenge actually to live in the world of public health. Because public health people treat people who live in poverty or who are ill as victims, as their patients, as people they want to help as helpless people. But for me, I come from a background where those are the fighters and I'm their ally, driving change with them. So that is a struggle I live with, that I work with people who come from public health who want to see these as helpless victims and I see them as powerful warriors for social justice. So that's that's what gives me hope, that people here are not just sitting there and lying down to die, but they are finding solutions. And what I need to do is organize, 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 and connect with them and give them what I have to use to fight.
the young girl from Uganda who came from humble beginnings, became an engineer. There you are. Became a politician, yeah. activist, uh, head of Oxfam. Duh, head of, you're uh, talking about me. UNA. <laughs> she sounded great, didn't she? <laughs> oh, no. she's, she's at a point where she's at peace with herself and what she's doing. What comes next? I don't know. Like I told you, I'm nomadic. I wouldn't know where I would be. I, I generally have a cycle between five and seven or eight years. I move into some other challenge, but I'm getting older too. So, but I don't worry about that. There's always a call for social justice. I see myself returning to the movement in Uganda for social justice, for women's rights. I'm already working. I've been with them for years, but I don't even think about five years time. I think about next year, this year. That's how I move. I'm nomadic. I'm you, nomadic you, like the Maasai people whose clothes I'm wearing. You're nomadic and you're a truly fascinating person. Thank you so much for this interview. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're such a wonderful interview. Thanks. I hope you got what you needed. Yeah, we did. I enjoyed it. Very much.